Sorry, minor emergency. <laughs> Imagine me lighting this chalice. The history of every major galactic civilization tends to pass through three distinct and recognizable phases, those of survival, inquiry, and sophistication, otherwise known as the how, why, and where phases. For instance, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second by the question, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where shall we have lunch? We light our chalice today to honor the light of knowledge and the warmth of human development and to honor lunch. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Des Moines and our digital service. I'm Reverend Amy Petrie Shaw. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I'm here speaking to you today from land that's the traditional territory of the indigenous Iowa people. Louise Alcorn, as you can see, is our celebrant. And Barb Martin is going to be our song leader today. Bruce Martin is our pianist. And Susan Gellinger is the pastoral care associate this week. So if you need her, please call her. Anais Nin writes, life is a process of becoming, a combination of states that we have to go through. Where people fail is that they want to elect a state and remain in it. This is a kind of death. We don't grow absolutely and chronologically. We grow sometimes in one dimension, not in another, unevenly. We grow partially. We're relative. We are mature in one realm, childish in another. The past, present, and future mingle and pull us backwards and forward or fix us in the present. We're made up of layers and cells and constellations. If you had to boil all that down, you could just say, you know what? People are weird. People are complex. Today, we're going to be talking about complexity, about growth and development and change, life, the universe, and everything, Douglas Adams. So come on in, and let's be in community here together. All we ask is that you please keep your microphones muted throughout the service. After the service, you're welcome to turn on your mics and join us in a breakout coffee hour. So welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Des Moines Digital Service. My name is Louise Alcorn. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the celebrant for this morning's service. And like the character Arthur Dent from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I could never get the hang of Thursdays. No matter who you are or where you've come from, you're welcome here. Whether or not you live in Des Moines or have ever physically been to the First Unitarian Church of Des Moines. Whoever you are, we hope that you find something here today to help you on your life's journey. And remember, anything that happens, happens. Anything that, in happening, causes something else to happen, causes something else to happen. Anything that, in happening, causes itself to happen again, happens again. It doesn't necessarily do it in chronological order, though. Our gathering song this morning is number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. That's 361. The words are copied in the chat screen. Please keep your mics muted and simply sing along at home if you would like. Don't be afraid 
of some change. Don't be afraid of some change. Today will be a joyful day, and to rejoice and come in. Thank you so much, Barb. Our story for all ages this morning is a fun one called World Pizza by uh, Cece Meng, and it's going to be read by Gavin Adams. So let me bring that up right now. And we're going to enjoy Gavin speaking. Here we go. Um, I'm in fifth grade. World Pizza by C. Smen, illustrated by Ellie Sheep. The tall hill with the cherry trees and the soft grass for chairs was the best place to look for a wishing star. Mama found such a star, the first to be seen more than a hundred years. It was not the brightest nor the biggest in the sky that night, but it was still a true wishing star. So Mama made her wish. I wish for World Pizza. Achoo! said Mama. A floating cherry blossom had tickled her nose into a giant sneeze. Mama wished for world pizza, said Jack. I think she meant world peace, said Papa. I definitely heard the word pizza, said, Zo said, said Joe. Peace, said Papa. Pizza, howled Baby Mo. He reached up and squeezed Papa's nose. Let's, let's not fight, said Mama. Just send a Pizza fell from the sky and landed, gen as, landed as gentle as a warm blanket on Mama's lap. The kids don't know about peace, but they know about pizza, and this particular pizza was delicious. Mama, in her heart, still wished for wish for peace, for a world for a world filled with kindness and love and no fighting. But she agreed pizza was delicious, so they ate until their bellies were, were, were full and everyone was happy. Across the world in another town on another hill sat another family and another pizza carried on carried carried on the wind. Appear, appeared this one landed atop the father's head. The, that family agreed the pizza was delicious so they ate till their bellies were full and everyone was happy. Pizza appeared in valleys, deserts, and on the very topmost points of, of snow-blowing mountains. Pizza rained, down, pizza rained down up to cars, subways, boats, and planes. People living in the biggest buildings of the biggest town got pizza. pizza people living in the smallest building in the smallest town got pizza. People with no place to live at all got pizza. Those people got extra pizza. There was spicy pepper pizza, salty seaweed pizza, chocolate cherry pizza, and extra cheesy pizza with pickles. None of those pizzas were the same, but they were all delicious. Some people dipped their pizza in hummus, while others dipped their pizza in guacamole. Some people made pizza chow mein, and some people made pizza sushi. Some even made pizza soup. They all agreed different pizzas were delicious, so they shared, and everyone was happy. The bully on the playground pointed and laughed at the unusual-looking pizza till, until the kids offered him slices. They ate and realized he liked the new flavors, and he liked his new friends even more. The pirates on the rough ocean seas put down their swords to eat pizza. They agreed the pizza was... So, suppered once they stopped fighting they once they stopped fighting they realized they were tired of being angry and tired of hurting each other so they kicked their swords to the bottom of the sea and all the pirates were happy even angry neighbors with tall fences and locked doors got pizza they peeped over their fences and frowned at the pizzas that looked nothing like their own they shook their fists and 
called out, go away, until the scrumptious smell made them stop. They, and they looked, and they, and they looked at the faces of all the different people eating different, every kind of pizza imaginable. They saw smiles, they saw smiles, and they couldn't help to smile back. So they opened their doors wide and joined, and joined the fun outside. There are pizza cut tossing contests. There were pizza parties. There was even a pizza parade. People all over the world talked and laughed and ate until their bellies were full. And after the pizza was gone, the people stayed. They made friends and in the mo and in that moment the world was filled with kindness, love and no fighting. On the top of the tall hill with the cherry trees and the soft grass for a chair, Mama picked up the last piece of pizza. She gave it to a stray dog that followed them home. As Mama tucked Jack, Jill, and Baby Mo into bed, Jack yawned and said, Oh, Mom, I'm sorry you didn't get your wish for world peace. Mama gave each child a kiss and turned out the light. Next time, she whispered, the family fell asleep, cozy in the warmth of their peaceful dreams, and everyone was happy. That was awesome, Gavin. Thank you. And we are going straight into our special music this morning. Elaine Imla and Kent Newman um, performing Let Me Sing by the Honey Dew Drops. This is Let Me Sing by the Honey Dew Drops, a duo that played at First Unitarian Church for one of our Progressive Voices concerts. Uh, thanks so much to Doug Opperly for all his work on that. We're really missing it this year, and hopefully we'll get it back sometime. Let me sing. Let me sing with my own voice. Make my words clear and true. Time till my song is through. Let me sing, let me sing, let me walk with my own hands through the day and Thank you, Kent and Elaine. That was wonderful. Our offertory this morning is done with my normal seriousness. 
A turkey farmer decided one morning to attend a dreadfully fashionable church in his town. He came in his work clothes, smelling exactly like his turkey pens. And the church folks were outraged at the smell. The pastor said to the farmer, the next time you come, you better ask the Lord what you should wear. The farmer agreed. And the following Sunday, he came back wearing exactly the same clothes. The furious pastor said, how could you come in here like that? What did the Lord say? The farmer replied quietly with a smile. The Lord said he'd never been to this church and he didn't know what to wear. And I'm going to go become a Unitarian. Now, I'm not sure about the Lord, but whatever you're wearing, you're welcome here. Our morning offering this morning is going to be given through a link in the chat. And if you give me just a second, I will put that up. One half of what comes in through our electronic plate goes directly to our internal social justice work. And one half goes to support the work of our Faith in Action partners. So the link is up. And the morning offering will now be given and so gratefully received. Thank you so much for these gifts and for everything that you do. And thank you, Bruce. That was lovely. We have a spotlight today from our Faith in Action partner, Planned Parenthood. And I'm going to put that on now. Everyone, my name is Beth Mensing. I will be joining you again um, from Planned Parenthood in North Central States to uh, talk a little bit about the Transgender Day of Remembrance. I'm a manager of education uh, here in the Des Moines area, and I've been with the organization for nine years. And I'm uh, excited to be able to join you again. And, and um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the Transgender Day of Remembrance. It is a, a day... Um, an annual observance on November 20th that honors the memory of transgender people whose lives were lost in acts of anti-transgender violence. Additionally, the week before the Day of Remembrance, people and organizations around the country participate in Transgender Awareness Week to help raise visibility for transgender people and uh, address issues that the community faces. So the Transgender Day of Remembrance was started in 1999 by a transgender advocate, Gwendolyn Ann Smith, as a vigil to honor the memory of Rita Hester, a transgender woman who was killed in 1998. 
the vigil commemorated all of the uh, all of the transgender people lost in violence since Rita Hester's death, and began an important tradition that has become the trans the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance. Gwendolyn Ann Smith uh, states that the Day of Remembrance seeks to highlight the losses we face due to anti-transgender bigotry and violence. And I am no stranger to the need to fight for our rights, and the right to simply exist is first and foremost. With so many seeking to erase transgender people, sometimes in the most brutal ways possible, it is vitally important that those we lose are remembered and that we continue to fight for justice. So on November 20, 20th, you can participate in a vigil, um, attending or organizing a vigil to honor all of those transgender people whose lives were lost to anti-transgender anti violence in the year and learning more about the violence affecting the transgender community. Vigils are typically hosted by local transgender advocates or LGBTQ organizations or held and they're held at community centers, parks and places of worship and other venues. The vigil often includes reading a list of names of, of folks who transgender individuals that have been lost throughout the, the year. We do want to remind you that in the times of COVID, we need to take all necessary precautions. And if you choose uh, to, to do a more a smaller or more private vigil, you can um, maybe uplift stories that are shared on social media or sharing stories that you that you encounter um, on the day of remembrance, but also throughout the year, um, people who have been um, victimized by crime and maybe um, additional, maybe you can uh, lift up additional resources um, to, to help people that uh, have been affected by, by this violence. And we know that although transgender and non-conforming people continue to face oppression and violence in the United States and around the world, that they are resilient and strong and loving. Planned Parenthood is proud to stand with them, and we are committed to making our, our country a place where no one experiences discrimination or violence because of their gender identity or expression. So this November 20th and every day of the year, Planned Parenthood stands with transgender people. We see you, we care about you, and we stand in solidarity with you, no matter what. If you'd like to learn more about the Transgender Day of of Remembrance or about Transgender Awareness Week, you can visit resources like GLAAD, the Anti-Violence Project, the National Center for Transgender Equality, or the Trans Women of Color Collective. Thank you for giving me a few moments of your time today and letting me visit with you. Um, stay safe and hopefully we will see each other in person uh, someday soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks to our Faith in Action group for bringing us that spotlight today. Every week I remind you that the church isn't the building, but the community. And right now it's more important than ever as COVID surges here in Iowa. The church is who we are together. The church is being there for each other in the good times and the bad. The church is laughing together and crying together. We have some marvelous joys that Jean McCracken sent in this week to share. First Unitarian Church's entry won the Family Promise Comfort Food Award. So go us. Um, we will have the Traveling Soup Pot Award for one year. So kudos to Elaine and Sue for coordinating our efforts. The entry was hot chicken salad casserole. And I'm betting if we aggravate Jean, we can probably get the recipe to post in the intercom. Uh, he also said there was great community support for El Exodo's Mary E. Campos Scholarship Luncheon. Almost $20,000 was raised for scholarships for Latinx youth. Um, we had great First Unitarian support, both champions and donors. So really grateful for the continuing support of our long-term partner, El Exodo. Um, Pat Winters on the... Um, Concern side, Pat Winters was discharged from the hospital and was going home. Um, we don't have other details yet. Um, she's going to have some help at home, but she's appreciated the cards she's gotten and she would love to receive emails 
Um, her information is in the directory. If you can't find it there, please give me an email and I will give you her home address and her um, email address. Please feel free to send cards and emails. Uh, Florence Freddie was in the hospital this past week. She's been having some nosebleeds and um, she's going to be going to a rehab and um, probably Wesley. So the, she, you know, she would love cards. She would love uh, messages. Please send cards to her home her home address at this time and her daughter's going to make sure that she gets them. She's uh, she's aware that she's going to be moving and she's calling it a new adventure. So sending her her good wishes and lovely cards on her new adventure might be nice. And again, she's in the directory with her home address. If you don't have it, you're welcome to get a hold of me and I'll get it for you. Please share with us now the names of anyone else we know that could use some special care and attention this week. You're welcome to put those names in the chat. Anyone that you want us to hold in our hearts right now, please put them in um, and let the love of this community hold them all. May the light of our community shine on the broken places of the world on all those who are sick and who are caring for the sick, on all those dealing with the election, on all those living in fear. May we travel together with all those who fight for equity and justice in human relations. May the work of our hands and our hearts support and comfort everyone who's marginalized or silenced, everyone who's at risk, May we be called to action by the needs of those who struggle against violence and pain and destruction. May all those who are grieving be comforted. May you be comforted. May those who are tired find rest. May you find rest. May the broken places be healed. May you be healed. And may those who are filled with joy and laughter be abundant. And every week I light three candles. Ones for all the joys and the sorrows that we've shared here together. And ones for the names that we've written in the chat. And I light one last candle for all of the joy and all of the sorrows which are held deeply in our hearts but which we haven't been able to share here today. Our first reading this morning is from Don't Panic by Meredith Borders. Of all the things that make the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy vital reading, the advice within is the most indispensable. Adams isn't only witty, talented, and sly, he's also wise. The wisdom contained in the novel is mostly due to the book within the book, the actual Hitchhiker's Guide for which Ford Prefect is a researcher a travel guide for affordably traversing the known universe. The history of which is one of idealism, struggle, despair, passion, success, failure, and enormously long lunch breaks. Some guidance provided inside these wonderful pages include 
never forget your towel. You can sleep on it, warm yourself with it, carry something in it, protect your head with it, engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with it, wave it as a distress signal, sail on it, and of course, dry yourself off with it if it still seems to be clean enough. Also, the knack to learning to fly is to throw yourself at the ground and miss. Pick a nice day and try it. Earth is mostly harmless. Time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. Those who created robots are a bunch of mindless jerks who'll be the first against the wall when the revolution comes. The history of every civilization in the universe generally goes through three phases of intellectual evolution. Survival, how? Inquiry, why? And sophistication, where? For instance, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second by the question, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where shall we have lunch? And most importantly, don't panic. Also, 42 is the answer. Our words for meditation this week are a poem called To Risk by William Arthur Ward. To laugh is to risk appearing a fool and to weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out to another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing your true self. To place your ideas and dreams before a crowd is to risk their loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure. But risk must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. They may avoid suffering and sorrow, but they cannot learn, feel, change, grow, live. Chained by servitude, they're a slave who has forfeited all freedom. Only the person who risks is free. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change and the realist adjusts the sails. So with those words in mind, please join me in three minutes of silent thought, meditation, or prayer.
Our second reading is from A Eulogy for Douglas Adams by Richard Dawkins, the science writer. Douglas introduced me to my wife, Layla. They had worked together years ago on Doctor Who, and it was she who pointed out to me that he had a wonderful childlike capacity to go straight for the wood and never mind the trees. For instance, if you try and take a cat apart to see how it works, the first thing you have on your hands is a non-working cat. Life is a level of complexity that almost lies outside our vision. It is so far beyond anything we have any means of understanding that we just think of it as a different class of object, a different class of matter, life. Something that had a mysterious essence about it was God-given, and that's the only explanation we had. The bombshell comes in 1859 when Darwin publishes On the Origin of Species. It takes a long time before we really get to grips with this and begin to understand it. Because not only does it seem incredible and thoroughly demeaning to us, but it's yet another shock to our system to discover that not only are we not the center of the universe, and we're not made of anything, but we started out as some kind of slime and got to where we are via being a monkey. It just doesn't read well. I'm happy to say that Douglas's acquaintance with a particular modern book on evolution, Dawkins's, uh, Dawkins' own, which he chanced upon in his early 30s, seems to have been something of a Damascus experience for him. It all fell into place. It was a concept of such stunning simplicity, but it gave rise naturally to all of the infinite and baffling complexity of life. The awe it inspired in me made the awe that people talk about in respect of religious experience seem frankly, silly beside it. I'd take the awe of understanding over the awe of ignorance any day. I once interviewed Douglas on television for a program I was making on my own love affair with science. I ended up by asking him, what is it about science that really gets your blood running? And here is what he said, again, impromptu and all the more passionate for that. The world is a thing of utter inordinate complexity and richness and strangeness that is absolutely awesome. I mean, the idea that such complexity can arise not only out of such simplicity, but probably absolutely out of nothing is the most fabulous, extraordinary idea. And once you get some kind of inkling of how that might have happened, it's, it's just wonderful. And the opportunity to spend 70 or 80 years of your life in such a universe is time well spent as far as I'm concerned. Our centering song today is number 135, How Happy Are They? The words will be in the chat screen. Please keep your mics muted.
Douglas Adams was fascinated by how simple things become complex things. He loved science. He's been called a lot of things, everything from certifiably lunatic to brilliant, amazing, hysterical. You have to read his work to understand who he was, and even then you're going to walk away feeling like you've been well hit by a brick. He did write the phrase we've heard a few times this morning about the history of every major galactic civilization passing through three distinct and recognizable phases, survival, inquiry, and sophistication. But what he's really saying there is it starts simple and it gets complex. The first phase is characterized by the question, how do we eat? The second, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where shall we have lunch? He's talking about science. He's talking about the journey toward adulthood for a civilization or a person, simple to complex. And Douglas Adams wrote a four book trilogy. And if that makes your brain hurt, you haven't seen anything yet. He wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the books that came with it. Four book trilogy. Life, the universe and everything. That's even the title of one of the books. Life is messy and confusing, he says. Large parts of it disagree. And just when you think you have it right, well, your planet gets blown up to make way for an inner space bypass. Life is challenging. Science is messy. What's important is that you take the advice on the front of your hitchhiker's guide, which tells you in large friendly letters, don't panic. Don't panic and always know where your towel is. A towel, he says, is the most massively useful thing an in interstellar hitchhiker can have. It has practical value. You can wrap it around you for warmth as you bound across the cold moons of Jagulan Beta. You can lie on it, inhaling heady sea vapors. You can sleep under it. Wrap it around your head to ward off noxious fumes or avoid the gaze of the ravenous bug bladder beast of trowel which is such a mind-bogglingly stupid animal that it assumes if you can't see it, it can't see you. He said it's daft as a brush, but it's very ravenous. You can wave your towel in emergencies as a distress signal and of course dry yourself off with it if it still seems clean enough. But here's the important part. Most importantly, it has immense psychological value. If for some reason a non-hitchhiker discovers that a hitchhiker has his towel with him, he'll automatically assume that he also possesses a toothbrush, face flannel soap, tin of cookies, flask, compass, basically all the things you need to have. What the non-hitchhiker will think is that any person who can hitch the length and breadth of the galaxy, rough it, slum it, struggle against terrible odds, win through and still know where their towel is, is clearly a person to be reckoned with. What's that mean in simple English? Well, it means keep going on the small stuff. When it all gets scary and confusing, do the laundry, wash the dishes, read a book, make lunch. Sometimes the small stuff gets you through when the big stuff is too terrifying to even contemplate. Do the small stuff. Go figure out where your towel is. Some of us pass through all of Douglas Adams' stages, that why, when, so we do it before breakfast daily with our towel wrapped around our head or our arm. We're Unitarians, and that generally means that we are examiners of life, whether we want to be or not. Sometimes we're like Adams' confused everyman character, the often put upon Arthur Dent. 
we think we get the rules, but the rest of the universe seems to have eaten the rule book and then things explode. Other times were Zaphod Bibobrox, the coolest two-headed character ever to steal a spaceship. In his own words, he's a real loopy fruit who always knows where his towel is. We explore, we question, we grow. Most of us would not panic if we found ourselves at Adam's restaurant at the end of the universe. We'd just pick up our menu and start asking questions, mostly about what goes into a pan-galactic gargle blaster, his signature drink. It's said to be, by the Hitchhiker's Guide, the best drink in existence. It's, it's impossible to make here on Earth, but the effects are similar to having your brain smashed in by a slice of lemon wrapped around a large gold brick. Who am I? What's the factual truth? How do I understand hope in the face of evil and death? How do I live my life? Or as Adam says, life, eh, funny old thing, really. We're on a quest to discover the answer to life, the universe, and everything from the minute that we're born. But as we explore our own universe of the earth and its contents, we change and we grow. Our ability to understand and engage with and care about these questions changes and involves through our life. And it doesn't do it in a steady fashion. It goes back and forth. I'm willing to bet that some of you are experiencing COVID brain right now. Everything seems foggy and fuzzy. It's hard to get tasks done. You're stressed, bored, overwhelmed. You make lists and don't finish them. You start into a room and forget why you were going. It feels like you lost your towel. It's easy to think that because we've progressed from how do we eat to why do we eat, that we're going to stay there forever. We've moved from simple to complex, but it's not the way it works. We evolve and sometimes we devolve and we evolve again. We move from survival to sophistication and we move back and each year, each decade, our ability to move between them gets better. So you might go backwards for a little bit or a lot, but you learn, you learn each time, you grow each time and the next time you move more quickly, you might back up but you go forward again faster. You find your towel faster. There's been a lot of scholarly work written about our growing up process as questioners and examiners. Uh, Robert Keegan wrote The Evolving Self, Robert Coles, The Spiritual Life of Children. James Fowler's did Stages of Faith, all about how this has evolved in the church process. Gary Leak um, did a lot of empirical, measurable research on how we grow spiritually. And it's, it's an interesting article and book. Gary, L-E-A-K. Socrates said the unexamined life isn't worth living, but Robert Fulgham says the examined life is no picnic. And we're caught between the two. Learning to answer core questions, to move through the stages of life and development toward an overall sophistication or transcendence, it isn't easy. Nobody said it was going to be. We all start out like Arthur Dent in the books, concrete, full of simple answers to questions about how the world works and how things are supposed to go. Anybody ever tell you that lie? Here's how things are supposed to go. Bet they didn't mention COVID. Our how things are supposed to go is way out of whack. But we learned concrete things about how the world is supposed to work. We learned all the rules, the do's and the do nots. We learned things like don't bite people 
and houses stay where they're put and cars move around. We learned basic science. We learned basic civilization. The universe has rules. And if you don't happen to have a hitchhiker's guide, you have to learn the rules for yourself. Adam says a learning experience is one of those things that says, you know that thing you just did? Don't do that again. As a child or a civilization grows, the questions do move from how to why. From what is real for all to what do I believe to be real? From how do I live to how do I live what I've come to believe? We start to explore the reasoning behind the do's and don'ts, to try to examine what we're told, see if what we learned is actually what we believe to be true. For some people and some ideas, the search stops right there. Here's what I believe. Here's why I believe it. I know how to get food and I know why I have to eat. I'm done. But most of us are still curious. We've become teenagers, if you will, at that point. We know what we believe and why we believe it, but we want more. We want more ethical and more moral development. Most teenagers take a deep look at the world and tear it to pieces, trying to find what is it that makes it tick and how can it be put back together better? And yeah, they have a bunch of screw-ups. We all do. They take the cat apart to see how it works and find out it's a non-functional cat. But eventually we get it. Eventually we become a grown-up. We ask daily, where shall we have lunch? We return to the core questions. Who am I now? What is my truth and my story? How do I understand hope in the face of all the hopelessness? How do I live my truth? They're not just questions, they're essential questions, religious questions. And answering them is a religious understanding, an experience of education that transcends the content to shape your life. This is that part about being called to a responsible search for truth and meaning. It demands a focus on knowledge and growth, and it should. How do we live our beliefs? How do we continue to re-examine ourselves? You know, sophistication isn't easy. We make mistakes. We get lost on the way to the next planet. Our android gets eaten by a ravenous bug bladder beast. We decide to have a pangalactic gargle blaster or 20. It's easy to get lost in a big galaxy. But what pulls you back over and over is the search itself. You don't have to be good at it. You just have to do it. Life is more than simple answers like 42. You have to pick life up and examine it and poke at it and ask it questions and examine it again until you're sure you believe what's coming out of your own mouth. And if you don't, you start poking again. You poke at it until you're living your beliefs in the world. And then you poke at it some more to make sure you really believe them. So stick out your metaphorical thumb and hitch a ride out here into the galaxy of experience and wisdom and never panic. Because life, the universe, and everything is out there waiting for you. It's weirder and more wonderful than anything you've ever expected. Don't forget your towel. Now, where shall we have lunch today? All right. Well, I've got my towel, so I'm all set. So now I'm heading out, and we're going to extinguish the chalice. And we know that the search for truth matters as much as the truth we find. Wherever you go on your search, remember, don't panic. Our final song today is number 140, Hail the Glorious Golden City. The words will be in your chat screen. Please keep your mics muted and simply sing along at home if you would like.
Together, may we learn and grow, and in the words of Douglas Adams, let us think the unthinkable, let us do the undoable, let us prepare to grapple with the ineffable itself, and see if we may not eff it after all. The service has ended, and your service in the world begins again. Peace, ashe, and may it be so.